open um, the panel with, can you describe to everyone what is a good, bad, or terrible interview experience you've had while working for Leo's? Sure. Um, I'll describe my own first experience as just a baseline for everyone to know where you can go with your careers. Um, <clears throat> out of school, I had a portfolio that was based around roughly some brand identity, uh, business cards, letterhead, maybe a matchbook. And upon showing my portfolio, the reaction across the board was that I had no actual real experience with clients. And as a student, this was me starting out, I was there to start this experience of working with clients and having a job. So it was uh, pretty frustrating and I think that I've spent a lot of time working with teams now to shift how that feels and I'm looking forward to sharing with you some of the ways that you can show your portfolio for the first time and have a lot more impact than I do. Hi everyone. Uh, second panelist this evening, Boris Long. Boris is the senior VP of the West Coast at Onward Search, a recruiting agency that specializes in helping fine creative folks like yourselves find both freelance and direct hire positions. Does anyone want one of those? Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Yeah. Boris is a man of gentlemen and a gentleman. He's a leader, a certified guru, know-it-all genius in the recruiting industry. Everything he says is an absolute fact, and everything everyone else says isn't per se wrong, but I would suspect, <laughs> and you should watch out. So, Boris, can you tell us uh, a terrible portfolio experience that you've had? Absolutely. And uh, before I get into that, thank you guys so much for uh, bringing all of us out. Uh, it's a great experience. Um, anytime we can work as recruiters to kind of help and give back to the different candidates, put a name to the face, I think it's a great opportunity and I'm excited to be here. Um, when I thought of a terrible experience, um, it's hard to say because that always sounds so negative, a terrible uh, portfolio viewing experience. The, the one that came to mind wasn't actually a portfolio but a resume. Um, and it was this candidate that we had placed I had placed years ago, I placed her with the NBC, she was a rock star candidate, and um, got great reviews, she was always amazing, like people were saying, hey, she is awesome, like this is a great candidate. I worked with this person for years, because that's what happens when you're a recruiter, you build these relationships with people and you're able to place them, but I hadn't met her for, for years, and uh, I had sent her out, and I had my recruiters, we were sending her out to various clients, and she just wasn't getting placed, I was like, what is the deal? I was like, Michael, why don't you bring this, this gal in? And so she came in and uh, she was sitting there and he was like, uh, Oris, maybe you should come and meet me and see her again. And she was sitting there and she just brought out, I don't know what happened in her life, but it clearly changed, but she was sitting there and she just brought out this wrinkled, crappy resume from her purse. And I was like, what happened? Is this the same candidate that I always, See, and it was just like, it was unbelievable, but um, I guess it goes to show that it doesn't matter, what, it, it, things change in people's lives, one, you know, they can be, or uh, people can pose as completely different people, I have no idea exactly what happened, but the point is, uh, she, yeah, it was just, uh, it was a crazy experience, so that's where I am, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 And then our last panelist is David Niave, who's an Associate Creative Director of U.S. at Saatchi and Saatchi LA. Um, David, better yet known as Davey, is a fourth generation Japanese American and native Angelino, who throughout his career has strived to help people see bigger, so that together we can see bigger. Fun fact, or a couple of fun facts is, um, he wants 824 Jack in the Box tacos in the one city. <laughs> so you should definitely ask him afterwards. Hot sauce or hot sauce. He wrote a book from Southern.
returning to northern Vietnam in 10 days. He has a 10 or nine month old daughter and he said it with a question mark. <laughs> I do, I do. Okay. <laughs> and um, as a child, he and still kind of today wanted to be a cartoon character's voice when he grew up. So, Davey, can you tell us about a good or terrible portfolio experience? Yeah, um, let's see. One of my experiences, I was applying for a job, and I wasn't really into this job. I, I didn't think I wanted it, it was kind of a backwards uh, position. I went to, the, went to it, and I was sitting there, I remember talking to them, there's the three founders of this company, and I can just feel the heat radiating out of my shirt. <laughs> I was like, this is so uncomfortable, and I was sweating, and it was disgusting. There was typos all over the portfolio. It was just, it was, it was terrible. Um, I got the job somehow, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, was just, it was disgusting. Uh, a good one was that, uh, I called this place every day for, he's, I would call and he would say, check back next month. I would call literally the day of the next month. I didn't know what I was doing, this was early on in my career. And then four or five months later, I finally, they got me in and they got the job, whatever. And they're like, oh, you're the dude that kept calling. <laughs> <laughs> so persistency pays off. So the, the big question, and I think the question that you're all here to learn about today, amongst many things, this is the big one. Once it becomes full screen, it's real, so don't worry. Who are you? Me? Yeah. Who says that? <laughs> I'm Leon Rodriguez. Hi, Leon. Moderator. Nice to meet you. Panel moderator. Thank you. Tonight? Co-moderator. We're co-moderating. Thank you. The big question tonight is, is the portfolio book dead? And I think we should just let the panel have at it. Panel? You went first. You went first. I went first. No. No. Well. It's funny, I was asked this, I was talking to a friend of mine who happens to be looking for work, and he, I said, hey, how's your book coming? And he said, what's a book? <laughs> I said, I think you mean portfolio. I was like, yes, that's not a book, is not a thing anymore. So that sentence, yes, the book is dead. I haven't seen a physical book in a long time. Is I've a portfolio dead? No. I've seen some books. Really? Yeah, and we also make books. Um, four brands and a really, um, I would say, it's, we were talking about this earlier, it's not so much about the medium. And it's okay to start with a book or something digital. So it's all good. I agree. I would say, <laughs> I think, you know, you, we look for these answers and these kind of shortcuts as far as what we're trying to do to, get that next job, and really, it, it depends on who your end audience is, no different than any design that you guys do. So, if the person on the other end is gonna get jazzed by a uh, portfolio book, then it's good to have a book. If not, then it's not. How are you gonna know that? Well, you may not, but you can get that answer um, by defining what it is that you want, and I think that's what you have control over um, throughout the, the job search. One thing that I'll say though, it depends on what really gets you jazzed and fired up. If, if you've got a portfolio book and you love the work that's in there and you can convince that person on the other end to get fired up about it, um, just because it implicitly has value to you and you're excited about that work, that's gonna carry over to whoever is gonna be interviewing you, um, whether that's digital or whatever the medium is. Um, so, that's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking with, I'm UX, and she makes her own typefaces, and so we live in different worlds, right? And a physical book might make, might make sense, right? If you're designing a book, maybe you should bring a book. If you're designing a website, maybe a book doesn't make sense, right? And I think it just matters to 
Orbs. Orb. Orb. Orbs. 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 To his point, it, the medium matters. The medium matters to what you're trying to show. And so I, I think it just depends on who you are, what, you're trying, what job you're trying to get, who you're talking to. Thank you. That's great. Great, really great start. Um, can we have a show of hands if you're a graphic designer? Holy Is that 99.9%? <laughs> Is there anything left? UX designers? Yeah. A couple of them? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. It's very relevant to what you were just describing, yeah. the relationship between. Um, excellent. A round of applause if you're stressed out about building a portfolio book. There's good news, there's good news. Um, Boris, how many design jobs are there available today for people who are looking for design jobs? Today. Today, in this very moment. More or less. <laughs> 486, boom. <laughs> any, any sense of how many of those are um, graphic design for the people in the room? All of them. It's <laughs> great news, everybody. It's great news. Does that make you feel a little better? Yeah. No. <laughs> in Los Angeles. We do know it's very stressful. We yeah, do know we do know it's very stressful. And that scarcity thing uh, is somewhat fabricated and and you can look forward to communicating about your work to all sorts of different potential employers or collaborators. So that's something that our team focuses a lot on is uh, you know, shifting that notion that there isn't work, because there is. There's tons of work. I mean, we see it on a, a, every day. I mean, the unemployment rate is the lowest it's ever been. Um, people are struggling to find good talent. Um, and the challenge isn't always because there aren't any people out there. It's because it's hard to be able to differentiate and see um, people are busy. That's the reason why unemployment rate is so low. So, you know, you can apply to a LinkedIn ad and there could be a thousand other people that are seeing it, but if you can quickly fall to the bottom of that pile. So you have to differentiate yourself. You have to be able to stand out from the crowd, and you have to do things that people aren't going to do. Let's start with Sarah, um, a candidate that we place here. Um, she's coming to visit um, tonight. And something, it's like, it's a blessing and a curse. Everybody wants to be able to push a button in order to get a job, and that's, or to get anything, whether that's Uber or whatever else. And, that just opens up the search for everybody. It makes it easy for everybody. Instead of applying to 50 or 10 jobs, you can apply to 50 to 100, um, and everybody is applying. So if it's that easy, and the barrier to entry for those jobs is that easy, it just becomes a lot of noise. And I think that's where people struggle. And the feeling that everybody has, when, it, it's not just designers, it's everybody. When you're looking for a job, Everybody goes to the same, and it's documented, like the psychological process that people go through when they're looking for work. One day they feel like they're at the absolute bottom, the next day they, they're at the top, you know? And that's a human thing. Um, yeah, anyway, I can keep talking about it. Anyway. You'll have your, you'll have opportunity. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like that's a good segue into one of the topics, which is while looking at work and trying to differentiate yourself from the crowd, can you explain to the audience or what you're looking for when you're evaluating a portfolio between zero to three years out of school versus three to five years out of school? Sure. Uh, we were discussing this as well before the panel. Um, some of the easy ways you can start out to differentiate yourself is to not rely solely on sorry Adobe type kit. Uh, not rely only on trend-based work and kind of this super bastardization of design that goes on. And step back to get out in the world, observe typography. Typography is a big differentiator. Um, go research some fonts outside of Typekit that other people may not have access to. Ton, thousands of free fonts out there. Learn to draw some of your own and look at your work through the lens of what you're trying to communicate more than trying to compete with everyone else who's doing the same type of work. And Davey, you were talking about this too, so I'll throw it to you about some of the stuff that you've seen, so. Hey there. 
I think so. For us uh, at Sachi, we see a lot of candidates, obviously, and you know, on the digital side. We've seen more and more candidates come from and come through General Assembly and other schools, not, not to pick up General Assembly, they do good work in some cases. Uh, but <laughs> we see a lot of portfolios um, using Squarespace or some sort of off the shelf Wix or something like that. And I think there was a period where I saw 10 portfolios that looked exactly the same, same structure, same projects, just different colors, right? And in essence, it's fine, but the problem is, is that because of the saturation of designers here in LA um, and people taking the same classes, all, all of a sudden everything kind of looks vanilla, everything looks the same. Even though, you know, that work might have been really good, it, I start to bucket them into one thing, right? Because you just get clumped up. Um, I think to, um, to that point is, I think design the portfolio. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of your pieces in your portfolio, and I think that's the tricky piece, right? Um, I know that kind of is stressful because then you start to think about it as like, all this extra work, but you know, this is your, this is your pride and joy. Like, if you design it, then it's, it shows your capabilities, it shows your skill set, it shows your ability to communicate your work, um, and I think putting that in that pays off more, right? Can I disagree? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't like strongly disagree, dis disagree a little bit, wow. but I mildly disagree on that. The, the one thing I'll say about designing your own portfolio is there are a lot of these sites that are out there, and the thing that I hear from uh, creative directors more often than not is that they want to be able to see your work. They want to be able to see your thinking, and they, they're clearly evaluating you based off your work. The problem that happens when people design their own portfolio from scratch, especially if it's a d digital portfolio, is it becomes outdated quickly. So what happens is you're off on the job market unexpectedly, you're laid off and now you're using a portfolio that you designed three years ago and maybe the functionality still works and maybe the design was good and now you're still using this thing from three years ago and it kind of sucks. And now you're getting judged based off that and now you're wasting another 90 days to figure out how you're gonna put that together. So if you wanna design something, like totally do that, but know what you're investing in and the time that you're taking into and make it make it worth it. Like, I get it if you want to design your own portfolio, 100%. You guys are creative people and, and you guys are unique. That's kind of what makes a creative person a creative person. But you gotta know what the work is that you're gonna put into it too. And there's these sites that are out there now, Squarespace, I mean, they're hiring UX designers and entire teams to build these and think about the portfolio sites on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like. People are getting paid nonstop to be working on these things. Like, just pay the six ninety nine or whatever, and put your work up there, um, at least in a, as a temporary while you're like looking for a job. That's my advice. Um, but there are exceptions to the rule. There was a guy today that we were looking at, and I was going to share this portfolio with you guys. Rob Mason. If you guys want to look him up, Rob Daniel Mason. He's a copywriter in San Francisco, and he just happened to get presented today. His portfolio was awesome. He did it all by himself. Why was it awesome? Because he made it look like a, uh, a food menu from like a Chinese restaurant, and it was all like unique content, and it was purposely dated. So even if it does three years from now, it's gonna still look good. And he spent a lot of time on it. It was like, it was a really cool, thoughtful idea. I think, and I'll just stop there. I'm sorry. I have one um, our team, when we review portfolios, oftentimes, and I've talked to a few folks in the audience about this, it's a PDF on a big screen, and it's all good. And that gives you total flexibility to update your portfolio whenever you want. And it's a tool that you probably have access to exporting a PDF from one of your fine Adobe products. So um, <laughs> it's an easy way for an entry level designer to get their work in front of people and have to be up to date. Yeah, I guess I should uh, clarify. I don't think you should over-design your portfolio because the point of it is to show the work, right? And you don't want to take away from the work that you did. And to that point, it's like, we need to get it up as fast as possible. Like, these jobs are going. So get it up. No need to, like, Squarespace does a great job. And I think, too, at the same time, Squarespace is going to be updated in three years. Totally. So it's going to be the same problem. You're going to have to update that piece, find a new template or whatever, so you don't look like you chose 
the one that everybody chose three years ago. So it's it's going to be tricky. It's going to be this constant ebb and flow of how you how up the date it is and how much work you put into it. But I mean, you do need to stand out from the crowd, and it, it's difficult. It, it can't be difficult. One thing that I, I hear creative directors always asking for is show me your thinking. They want to be able to see the thinking in the in the projects and like have examples of the work. It's not just good enough to put your picture on there. If you're working as part of a larger campaign, um, a lot of junior designers will do this. They'll take credit for an entire campaign. It's like, you clearly didn't work on that Pepsi campaign by yourself. Like, what did you do? Like, and it's fine, whatever that that work is, Like, you'll differentiate yourself just by saying, hey, I was part of a team that did this, and um, being able to say specifically what it is that you did, tons of juniors miss this. Um, and then show the work that doesn't get produced. Like show your creative concept ability. Like show the things that you re worked really hard on that didn't get, that's like, like your time to show that work. Um, a lot of times people don't do that. And just to kind of follow what you're saying, <clears throat> for the more mature designers, we're definitely looking for that thought process. Where did the idea begin? If it's just the idea on a page written, how did you ideate from there to get to the next piece? Was it mood boards? Cool, show me some. And then some application, applied design. How did that design then get come out into the world and how do people experience it? Because that, and, and also what Laura said, acknowledge your team. I mean, we are so much better when we have great people to work with and collaborate with. Um, and so being able to talk about where you are within the team, the role that you played, and that also just shows that you're able to speak about your process, which is something we're all very interested in, in addition to your gorgeous design. I think, I think to that point is, is, what I realized as a hiring manager is that my job in hiring somebody is, do I want this person to come play with us, right? And at the end of the day, I gotta see your face every day. Right? <laughs> and if you're not somebody that I wanna hang out with every day, then I don't want to hire you, right? And so a lot of it is not just your thinking, but it's your personality, it's your soft skills, and all that kind of stuff. And and I think when when I, I always tell my friends who are in the job or candidates or schools, where it's honestly I'm looking for can this person think? Is this person halfway intelligent? <laughs> and then can this does this person have good taste? Because ultimately we can teach you how to design. Like you need to have some sort of you have to have portfolios, you can design something. Um, but if you can think and you can tell that you're intelligent and you have good taste, then we can get you the rest of the way. And so a lot of times in my, in my portfolio reviews or, or, or interviews, it's more like, tell me about yourself, let's talk, when's the last movie you watched? And we'll just have a conversation for a little while and like, oh, this person is halfway smart. We can actually, and then we can start to get into like, what did you like about this movie? And, and start to get into theory about something. And then that helps me understand, okay, I can sit with this person for, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, and well, like 12 hours a day, and, um, and, it, and it would be okay. Uh, I, I love this idea of proving your intelligence to someone as being a, a way of perceiving whether or not they might be a good designer, or at least someone that you might want to work with. Well, what are some of the other ways that all of these people can prove to you that they're intelligent? Uh, it's a good question, I think. Um, I, I, I don't know if you get where we get to this, but there's, we, were, we were chatting about some of the questions around introverts and extroverts, right? And that, that's a challenge because a lot of y'all start as artists and love to like tinker and become really nerdy into your work. And then all of a sudden you have to talk to the world about it. Like that's a new thing. And um, that's difficult. And then, then you gotta go sell yourself and there's this whole thing, right? Um, for me, in, intelligent, and I, one of the best interviews that I've, I've ever had the pleasure of interviewing, was this really quiet, really shy, introverted guy that's on our team today. And I was warned, because he's a friend, that he was quiet and he could be a little awkward. And I was like, okay, well that's fine, I can talk. And <laughs> he, he came and was, he came prepared with questions, he came prepared with intelligent questions, and it suited his skill set, right? He wasn't about to wow, well, um, win me over with this comedy, which I had this other dude who was a stand up comedian, that was <laughs> another thing, but he won me over with his questions and asking how I was 
how, does, how was the process? What's the team culture? What do you do in this situation? And, and then we had the conversation around it. And it suited his strengths because he's highly analytical, he's highly process driven. And we had a conversation where I was able to understand how he was going to come and be able to play with us. And at the end of the day, he's one of our, our star candidates. And now he's working on his ability to speak in public and on coming out of the shell and things like that. Um, but that, that I always think about that interview because so many times people will come in and try to be, this, be something they're not. And it, it, he played to his strengths and that worked really well. And he proved that he was intelligent without having to like, say it a lot. One of the things we look forward to connect um, is, are you listening? I mean, are you distracted? Are you with me? Are we just in the, are we in the same space together? And then what are you listening for, right? So as a candidate, you're, you're listening for opportunities where you can connect with the person who's asking questions of you and reviewing your work. And so you want to listen for something familiar or something that lights you up so that you can share that with them and have a moment where they can tell you were listening to what they were asking of you and there's an exchange. And so there's that intimacy that's created that also connects, I don't know if it's proving intelligence, emotional intelligence, and um, that's part of how we all want to connect with our collaborators. Wow, okay, no, I shouldn't be smart. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing? Can we just all agree that the interview process is absolutely absurd? <laughs> right? Like you're gonna meet with somebody for an hour and Judge whether or not you want to sit with this person for 40 hours a week for, in Lacey's case, eight years. Like, I've been working with her for eight years. I guess we're lazy every day. Good news is, we like each other, so it's cool. <laughs> but it's, it's hard. Nobody, it's, and, and people aren't trained in interviewing. Most people aren't trained in, in interviewing. Even recruiters, there's no book on how to be a recruiter. You know, it's like, you kind of figure it out. Uh, there are books on interviewing and interviewing best practice, but it's typically not taught in companies. And at the same time, if you ask, like there's statistics on this, 67% of the CEOs, the biggest problem that they have is finding the right people for their company, finding the right talent for their company. You go to the very top and they say, we need the right people for the company, because all companies are, are a big group of people, right? And a lot of people, they just get in an interview and they don't, how am I gonna, Talk, like, what am I going to ask this guy? I don't know. I'm just getting thrown in the interview. Um, but to that point, there is no standard because there is no, like, you don't go to USC and they go, hey, this is how you interview a candidate. And this is, you know, some statistics that we did, what we ran. It's kind of like everybody does it their own little way. And so everybody's looking for something different. And that's why there is no standard for this thing. We're all people. And we do it the best that we can, you know. And people try to game the system. They'll create this these huge... They'll say, hey, why don't we put 16 people in a panel interview and interview this person? And everybody's like, uh, okay. I put my thumb down. I don't like this person. Okay, we're not going to hire them now. 16 people, okay. I've had that happen. It takes years to fill a single job. It's crazy. But this is what people do. Anyway, so. Thank you. Uh, that kind of answered one of the questions you wanted to ask. Well, as a wrapping note, um, could everyone please answer, what is something you wish someone would have told you before you start your interview process to, you know, get, to get to where you are today. What do you mean, like, something that they're going to tell us to, so that we're better prepared with our job, or? Either better prepared for your job, better prepared on, you know, what steps we should take when you are preparing, or, you know, deciding what to ask for of who I would become. I kind of had this feeling like, oh, you get into a portfolio, you graduate, and then 
there you go. But um, over time, we week over week are pitching our work, are having to reinvent ourselves and um, represent different ideas, and it's in flux. So there isn't, shouldn't be so much pressure on the one moment, since those moments will be continuous. Um, I think the interview process is stressful. The portfolio process is stressful, I get it. I think what would be was really helpful would be helpful for me 10, 12 years ago is knowing that you just might not be the best candidate at this time. Not not because you aren't good, but because the company has their own business decisions and business needs that they're looking for and has really nothing to do with you or the portfolio. It just so happens that they need more some, somebody with more digital experience and you just don't happen to have that. Right? And it's not, no shade on you. That just happens to be what they're looking for today. Tomorrow they could have been look where like a year earlier they could have been they could have been specifically you and you just happen to already have a job at that time. And so I think I got really depressed and down on myself like I was no good and things like that, right? And the reality was like you it, it's like God it, the stars have to align for you to be available for this company to be looking for you, to you to see that, that, that posting, to you, like all this stuff has to align for you to be able to be in that room at that moment. So, I mean, if it doesn't work out, like, it's not on you, right? And you try your best to show up, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of other factors that go into the decision making that, as candidates, you just don't see. On, on the business side, there's a lot of conversation, post-interview, pre-interview, to decide whether or not this person is the right. Oftentimes, as a candidate, you just left in the dark, feeling really bad about yourself, and you go eat twenty-four tacos. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the origin story of this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if I were going to do, uh, if it was at the beginning of my career, one of the things I would have uh, told myself is just to know what I want, like figure out what you want, because um, it, that's the hardest part. I think when you really get down to it, the reason why this whole thing is tough is because uh, we conflate our sense of identity with our work. And you gotta ask yourself some really tough questions if you're gonna really get to the truth of who it is that you are and what you want out of the job. Um, companies are spending so much on talent right now and getting them what they want. It's like, figure out what it is that you want. Secondly, there's no, re it's not about the job. The job descriptions are pretty much BS. Like most companies are posting these jobs and. They're templated and they're they're junk. Like a lot of times, the the requirements in it they don't match up to what the hiring managers actually want. Um, again, it's because they're busy and blah 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 blah. But the thing is, if you work for people, you don't work for the specific job description. It's always funny like candidates go, "This wasn't in the job description." And it's like, what is going to be in the job description? You know, it's like you're working for people. You're working for managers, and you guys as creatives, it's not like. It's not like you're saying I want to be a rock star or like there's great creative directors all over the place in the city that are doing great work. Find out who you want to work for and connect with them. Like you'll differentiate yourself just by doing that. And there's no excuse on why you can't do that. If you're sitting right here right now and you want to go connect with David, I promise you there are not that many uh, junior designers that are reaching out on a daily basis saying, hey, can I just grab a cup of coffee and pick your brain? Not, I'm not even asking you about a job. I'm just asking to pick your brain as a creative director. Or Leah, who's one in a thousand creative directors. Like, don't go in for the job and the creative director title right off the bat. Just say, hey, can we just meet for coffee? I'd love to learn about your career because I'm curious about you as a human being. Like, just do that and you'll promise you you will get meetings. I promise you because nobody's doing it. Have you interrupted the are you clapping? <laughs> have, have either of the two of you, Leah or uh, David, sorry, or David, has, has a, a junior level person or someone reached out to you and said, "Can we have coffee and talk?" Right now, I have a, we take on um, mentees all the time. I mean, to be able to exchange with young designers, still in school, out of school, transitioning to a new job. Um, we 
constantly take time out to just connect with people and talk about what there could be for all of us. So, yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to, right? Like, I, that's one thing, that's one of my favorite things about my job, that I get to do that with people at my company that, that I get to talk to, but people aren't just randomly hitting me up, hey, can we talk? And, can I get can I get some of your opinion? He's got time. You know? <laughs> yeah. Get prepared for a lot of emails tomorrow. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> what I will say is you have to zig at when people are zagging, whatever that phrase is. Like you got to go against the grain. So if it's like if everybody does that, you're going to fall to the bottom of the list, right? But it's like do what people aren't doing. If it's easy, everybody's doing. You know, so, and that's why I say, like, get to the heart of what it is that you want to do as a person. Like, what gets you fired up? Um, if it is a title, like, that we were talking about before, like, it's so superficial. Like, really, is that what fires you up? Is getting a creative director title? Because people will use that all day long to underpay you, you know, or get you a job that, you know. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, that's my two cents. <laughs> Well, fantastic. <laughs> Who has questions? Great. Jonathan? Where's Jonathan? Can you help? He's going home. <laughs> Who wants me to throw a cube at them? It's a soft cube. Yeah. Don't be afraid. I'm not really going to throw it. That would be obnoxious. Toss it. I'll toss it. Is this far enough? Ready? You're talking to the people. Is there a mic? Oh. Yeah, this is what Kent's here does. What are your thoughts on beehives as a platform for creators? It's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I find interacting with their interface, and I've tried to search for candidates through Behance. Um, I don't. I find that the candidates don't often update the portfolios from my experience, so I, and it's been a few years since I've gone back to being hands for that reason. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult for us to go find candidates. If that's what you're using to show us, I mean, that's fine. It's just, it's like a digital PDF. Um, so if you're trying to show um, the digital, on the UX side, you're trying to show any interactivity, that, I mean, that's limiting. But I mean, if you're just trying to show, like, this LAFC stuff, that's just as good as a PDF, and it's digital. Cool, thanks. How far can you throw that? Do you want to come get it? We pick it up. Oh, do it! Yes. Since so he just wants their phone, I think that's going to be shit happening. All good. Okay.
the other question would be how do you look at freelancers versus oh. in-house employees, like external External freelancers versus hiring somebody full-time? Yeah, like do you consider them differently? Do you consider their books differently? Do you look at different things up front because they're not going to be like your underling person? That you yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, I mean, for me, for freelancers, they got to figure out money, right? I mean, that's money spent, that if you come in and you don't know what you're doing, then, uh, then I'm, you're, you're just evil, you yeah. So I'm depending on the, I'm looking for uh, real world experience, I'm looking for a process, can they communicate, um, we'll generally do a form screen, and that helps me understand if, did you actually do this work, or did somebody else do this work, that's, and then, yeah, so that process at that point helps because at least I know that you went through this and you have some idea of what you did versus somebody that is hired full-time. There's a little bit more of a runway that we have some more leniency and more grace in that, in that scenario. Um, I'll start with that part of the question, go backwards. But um, as a freelancer consultant, uh, we're looking for people who have skills that we don't have. Fill out something extra, something that would make our work more exciting and enticing to different types of clients. Uh, and then for in-house team, they really have to wear um, a lot of hats, so project management strength, strategic thinking, and killer design. And so it's a different type of candidate for sure. Um, but they, we, are, we, we interview both all the time, so it's interesting to meet consultants who help your team flex. It's very cool. And do we look at the case studies? Yes, um, not all of them, but it's important to be able to back up the design and the thinking, as, as Dave said. Uh, most of what we uh, refer to are actually freelance candidates. It's a bulk of what we um, do. We do about ten percent direct hire, um, so we like you know freelance talent. Um, I would say the main thing that you, you can't really tell freelancer versus uh, direct hire candidate or a full time employee unless you look at their LinkedIn and their resume. Um, I think where a lot of freelancers shoot themselves in the foot um, when they're looking for jobs with different creative directors and hiring managers is that they'll just start using their resume as like, they'll just start listing off bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, and like every job and company and brand, it just becomes a big block of, I work for NBC, and then I work for Honda, and then I work for, you know, and I, I would just say, curate the information to what it is that you want, and be, be more purposeful, just in general, with your resume and how you're presenting yourself. Um, it seems like a lot of times people are just putting keywords on a website, and I get it, uh, that's helpful, but it's also not because you just become noise. You know what I mean? And uh, I think you want to be purposeful in, in whatever it is that you're doing, um, unless you're just looking for any kind of work. And there's plenty of people who are doing. There's no shame in the game. It's like you want to be able to say you worked on auto, and you want to be able to say that you did CPG. If that's what you want, then do that all day long. If what you want is something that's different than what you're doing, or you feel like it's not working, then I would. I think to add to that is uh, we often would get stuff that, I mean, we're digital. I, I work in digital, right? So I'll, they'll show me some branding piece. I'm like, I, that doesn't help me. So it's like kind of curating your work, at least in the interview or in the, in the interview process, to who you're talking to would be helpful. Um, and that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. And then I'll say uh, that earlier point, I think writing is good, but you gotta like lead the person into, uh, like anything else, it's almost like a, it is a sales funnel. Like start with an imagery and then lead them into where they have to go in order to get that information because it's a lot of work for you. There's energy that you're, ex you're, you're whenever you're reading anything, like you're expanding energy. So it's like, just be, be thoughtful of that. You know, people don't read and they're looking for reasons to disqualify you. And it's only one reason. <laughs> They're just gonna go, no, let me go to the next one. So, um, yeah, but imagery is good. Like, I would start with that and then go into your case studies. And some people really like to read and they will read everything, but they want to be able to find quickly what it is that they're going to read about. Where do you want me to put this? You? <laughs> um, I 
I guess my question is, is this thing working? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, but my question is, because I'm just on the roller coaster, what would you say, as working professionals, is the average length of time for like a sweet, you know, long-term position? Do those even exist, or are they unicorns? As a freelancer, or as a full-time, or both? Either one. Uh, we have anywhere, for long-term, for a freelancer, we hire six months at a time, uh, three months at a time. For full time, like, I've worked with some people for four or five years, so it just depends on the, on the gig and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to product design, it's hard when the per there's high turnover because you lose all that legacy information about that product that we're trying to build. So ideally, we need people here for the long haul. Um, and even on the freelance side, it's better if we have somebody for multiple weeks, multiple months, so that we're not having to reteach somebody over and over again. Uh, not just the teaching, but the rapport and the relationship that you build, um, <clears throat> being able to, you know, my two closest collaborators are in the front row, Leslie and I always try to do the math, I think it's six years we've been working together, I don't think we'll, I, we're married basically, and I will be with her for as long as we are together and alive in this world. And so, I, she's been with us for four years, and um, it really depends on where she wants to go with her life. We would love for her to be with us con continually, and the rest of our team, we feel the same way, but I would say there's a difference in um, some of the younger candidates that we see coming through the studio, much more transient kind of style. They are looking for what's what's going to give me more money, what's next, how to build, put more names in the resume, like you were talking about, Morris. It's a name game, and it really depends what you're looking for. Uh, we are looking for a long-term relationship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and I uh, felt like even though I'm not a panelist, but um, I had worked in a position for about eight to nine months before, and by my ninth month, and it was like in-house editorial, I realized like I couldn't transform this, you know, this design anymore, and really it's just gonna repeat itself, and like repeat itself over and over, and was thinking like, do I want to do this for another year? And the answer was no, and then it was time to move. Um, and then I was at a studio for almost three and a half years, and I loved it, it was amazing, but by the time it was coming into three and a half, the question was more about, instead of do I want to do this forever, was can I actually grow anymore? Like, am I at my limit now here, or is it time to go somewhere else so that I can grow more as a designer and grow more as a person? Okay, hiring sucks. So like, <laughs> if we're gonna not have to hire ever again, like that's great. So, the longer. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's your work, right? I th and the pe the people that I've worked with that are on the shy side or on the more soft-spoken side, I, I say, you're yes, this is your personality. I don't want you to change who you are, but the reality is that you're not doing your work justice, right? And so it's not even for yourself. Do it for your work, right? You spend all your blood, sweat, and tears into it. It deserves you to be able to at least speak about it. So I'd say be prepared, right? Be prepared in what you want to say, and then. And then, and then be prepared to totally forget everything that yeah, you yeah, totally. say, <laughs> and that's still okay. Yeah. And, and, and say that, <laughs> say, man, I said I was planning for this. I was talking to some of you guys, like, man, I really I wrote the answers to the questions you guys sent. I was 
prepared. <laughs> and then everybody talked to me about what their concerns were, and I had to rethink what I was going to talk about. So, um, yeah, we're humans too. Yeah. So I mean, like, I'll allow my guy. Yeah. And, and designers are more introverted typically than, I mean, I don't know that you're, you need to be super extroverted, right? It's kind of the expectation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, raise your hand if you feel very, uh, if you feel that you're an introvert, very shy about talking about your work. Oh, okay. Uh, somebody gave me a really good piece of advice, and that was to, I mean, you have to figure out a way to not be shy about showing your work. And somebody told me once that you should interview as many times as you can for jobs you don't want. <laughs> and That's once you do that, then you'll feel really confident about yeah. what you're going to say. Yeah. That's it. Can I ask you a question? I think it all sucks. It sounds like it's so terrible to basically hire people. It's a drag. It's so, you know, like it takes time. Like we hire people. The question what I'd like to pose is actually, is it time for change maybe? You know, should we spice it up a little bit? In terms of what? Here, here's, here's what I would like to share with all of you actually, is that um, I'm working for a company called MediaMox. We are the largest digital production company in the world. And we're struggling with this as well. And you know, the traditional thing is the creative team is going to HR, say like, oh, we need this UX designer, whatever it is. HR picks it up. It's posted on LinkedIn. It's posted on wherever we are, right? And now this is the question. The question is, send me a resume. Send me a, a, you know, a, a letter of whatever words and you know, why you want to work for this company. We change the system. We change things now. We're spicing things up. And the way we do that is by basically posting a creative challenge. Because there's going to be way more discussion about an hour interview, right? If I post a briefing, if I post a creative challenge, because I'm working on a team where someone has to work tomorrow. So if that person works next to me, right, for the next 40 hours of the week, I rather have that person, you know, know what it is, know how it feels. So why wouldn't I challenge him in the same way as I'm challenging my own team? So I post that out, I let them submit, and the top five may come out for interview. It's and that kind of thinking, I think, you know, I don't want to throw that out to all of you, should we spice it up a little bit more? Because it feels such a drag, it feels like your portfolios all look the same, where is, where is the, you know, like, you want to see the, the, the thought process. It doesn't come, you know, like, is this the right solution? But how do they come to certain things? Then you have a conversation of an hour, which is engaging, which is great, which is exciting for everyone, instead of like, oh my God, now I have another interview. Yeah, I mean, right. that's what I would say. We look at tech companies and they're doing the same thing, right? They, their interviews aren't an hour, they're eight hours, right? And then you go through six rounds of interviews and you talk to different people and you have a whiteboard session and you have a portfolio session and you have a conference session and you have to go through your portfolio. This, they're, they're shaking it up, I, I guess, but it's, it's grueling work and it's over a three month period. Um, so I, I think what ends up happening is that events like this, meeting people, uh, talking to people, at, at the end of the day, it's like, I'm not going to LinkedIn oftentimes. I'm asking, do you all, do you know anybody that is looking for a group? Let's talk. Right? And then that's, you say, oh, I have friends and they'll give me referrals because at the end of the day, I, I skip over a lot of that, right? And we just, we have that uh, network. And so um, if you can hijack that system and I think that works out and yeah, maybe that's a great idea. Pose a, pose a question and put it on there. I think the, the concern I have with that is a lot of people are wary of doing any of that work because it's free work. It could become free work. Yep. And that, that's an issue that I have with a lot of companies that are trying to do spec work. Yep. And we make sure that we don't do that or projects with them because at the end of the day, then you can just take it and write it yourself and you just got 30, 40 hours yep. from five people. Right? And there's a lot of companies in LA that do that. Yeah, and that's that's my reaction too. Is like free work. Uh, we're a small shop. We are we are HR and we are all of those things. So when we hire, we are looking for the talent. We're seeking the talent. We don't necessarily post a job. If we do, we're kind of filtering through portfolios. And when we find great candidates, 
we find projects to test them on that they're paid to test. And that's how we start to work too. I'm biased, but if you can have a great recruiter who uh, yeah. I'm sure is, <laughs> Actually, I would say that the recruiters have helped me tremendously. And I think that as difficult, I mean, there's a lot of sharks out there that, that take advantage of a lot of it, but if you can find a really good recruiter on, that's on your side, um, that goes a long way because they can introduce you to other people. They be, almost become like your friend and mentor and ally in, in this crazy world. So um, I would say, Yes, please. Well, to continue the conversation that we're starting to run a little short on time, I'm looking for Julie because it's time to do the giveaways. Hey. 